How's it going guys? Welcome back. We've got a we got a GM car here, 2000 Buick LeSabre, and this is going to apply to a lot of cars. This car I picked up a P0336 code. That's a crankshaft uh, sensor code there. And you know, I thought this would be a good opportunity. Why don't we just dig into this here GM <clears throat> bypass ignition system. This will be pertinent to a lot of these GM cars once you learn this system. You know, it also applied to other cars out there, like Ford's, which uses the same system on some of the older vehicles there. So, you know, it's a lot of stuff we're going to cover. I think maybe in this video, we'll probably do an overview. We'll talk about the crankshaft sensor. We'll talk about the 18x signal, 3x signal, ignition module, how it changes those signals. Look at cam signal, see what it does. We're also going to look at, uh, we're going to take the Picascope out. This uh, for you, Steve, Rob, I think your name is, that we, uh, we do some of this stuff here. Kind of maybe a little tutorial as we're going. We'll talk about waveforms. We'll look at them. We'll discuss that. Uh, getting back to the car, we found out, uh, you know, a few days later, this thing uh, just kind of disappeared, you know, and I didn't have the time to look at it. So I went ahead. I read the code. I did get P0336. Few days of driving because I didn't have the time to look at it, and then it light goes off, and uh, cost seemed to be doing fine. But to give you the symptoms of what happened is I was driving home from work, uh, felt a little chuggle, felt like a little misfire. Looked down at the instrument panel, saw the check engine light on. Looked over to my left where the tack was at, and it was sitting at zero while I'm going about 55 miles per hour down the highway. Well, when I did get to the house, I did read I read the code right then. Saw the P0336, I said, well, I can't do anything now. So a few days later, the light went off and seemed to be doing fine. So I'm not going to be surprised if we go in there and we start looking at signals uh, on the waveforms and all that everything may appear okay. So probably, you know, go in there and we'll clean up connectors, possibly even maybe change the um, crankshaft position sensor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stress it. If uh, nothing shows up, I'm going to try to stress this sensor. If uh, ignition control module, because there's a possibility there, that could be a problem also. And uh, we're just going, we'll just take it, we'll just take it as it goes. We'll just wing it as we go along. I mean, I haven't played any of this stuff out, so like I said, I'll take you from the beginning. All right, let's talk about waste spark ignition. Now this is going to apply to uh, the GM car, but it's going to apply to all these other makes. So if you got this system, you got them all. All right, let's start off with the firing order on this particular car. 2000 Buick LeSabre, it's a V6 engine, got a 3.8 liter engine. Now the firing order on that is one, six, five, four, three, two. Now what it is in a waste spark ignition, it's gonna fire two spark plugs at the same time with one coil. So that means we've got three coils, all right, cause we got six cylinders. All right, so how can we figure out from this here firing order which coil is going to be devoted to which two cylinders? What you want to do is you take your firing order, you divide it in half. Take the four, uh, three numbers on the end, 432, we'll bring them back over here. Write them underneath. Okay, now take and draw vertical circles around, and there you go. One and four is going to be fired on one coil. 6 and 3 is going to be on another, and 5 and 2 is going to be on another coil. Okay, now these two cylinders here are called companion cylinders, just like 6 and 3, 5 and 2. Alright, companion cylinders are when the two pistons are moving up together and down together. So if this one here is at top dead center, that one's at top dead center. If this is bottom dead center, that's at bottom dead center. So they're moving together, okay, in sync with each other. Now, Let's say that number one is on top dead center, and let's say he is on the uh, compression stroke. Okay, now while this one is on the compression on top dead center, this one's on top dead center, but he is on the exhaust stroke. Now, as he as the uh, engine goes around through his uh, revolutions and he gets back, the rolls are going to reverse. Now, this one, number one, which was on compression, now he's going to become on the exhaust stroke. Number four, he'll be on the compression stroke. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about the ignition coils. We have three of them. 
Now these ignition coils are going to be fired every 120 degrees of crank rotation. So if you know it takes two crank revolutions, 720 degrees, then all of these cylinders will be fired on their compression stroke. But keep in mind it's firing two, two plugs at one time. Alright, now let's take a look at one of the ignition coils that I just mentioned. Now we're going to have a let me see if I can get this right here where you guys can see it. We're going to have a 12 volt ignition, positive. Now we're going to go through a fuse and we're going to go to a ignition switch, okay? And let's go ahead and we'll close them. And we're going to go through the primary winding on the uh, ignition coil. If you ever see two parallel lines like that, that means it's got an iron coil. And then we're going to come back and we'll draw our secondary and let's put him up like so. Draw them out there. Okay. Now, we know we have a plus up here. That means we're going to have a minus down here. Now, that means for this here coil to be energized, we need to connect this to DC negative. Now, if we put that right straight to ground, we've got, we've got current flowing through there. But let's take this through a transistor. That's where the, what it normally is going to go through. And let me draw a transistor here. And we'll come back and tell you what all is. Now this is a this is an NPN type transistor. I'm not going to go into the N-type and the P-type materials in the silicon crystals. We'll save that for another day. We don't need that any discussion on that anyway for what we're talking about here. Now, this being an NPN transistor, this means, and let me put down here what the elements are called on here, the terminals. This one right here is called the base. That's what's going to get the incoming signal to tell this transistor to turn on and off. This one up here is called the collector collects electrons from the emitter. Okay, now if I put a if I put a small positive voltage out here on the base and if I have it 0.7 volts or more then the transistor will turn on. But usually you want to have a little bit more voltage to that to fully turn it on. So I'm going to use 2 volts as a an example. That's positive volts. Now when I put positive volts on the base, then I'm going to have base emitter current. Okay, current going this way, and I'm using conventional current flow. Doesn't matter if you want to use electron flow, current flow, or conventional flow, it really doesn't matter. Okay, now by the way, you see how this here emitter with the arrow, okay, see how it's tying straight to ground? If you ever see a transistor configured that way, you know right there that this here transistor is configured to be working in a switch mode operation. Okay. Now, once we put the two volts on the base, we're going to get base emitter current, which is going to go through here, go through here, and then go down. Now once that happens, that is a signal pretty much to tell this transistor to turn on between the collector and the emitter. So we're going to have current flowing down through the winding, through the collector, and then down to the emitter, down to ground. Okay? So then, at that point, we have a magnetic field that's built up around this here primary winding. Now that primary winding has that field, it's, it's like an electromagnet, it's sitting there, and it's full of current and it is ready to do some work. It's got some energy stored up. Now, at that point, that's all it's doing. Now, the ignition control module is gonna say, we need to turn off the current through this. All right, so what's gonna happen is, this is gonna to go to zero volts. Now, once we put zero volts on the base, that is gonna be the signal to tell this here, between the collector and the emitter, to open up. So then, when it opens up, there's not going to be any current flow down through here to ground. Now when that happens, this here is going to stop the current flow, then the magnetic field is going to rapidly, rapidly collapse. 
When it starts collapsing, its magnetic lines of force is going to cut across the windings on the secondary side over here. And this is the primary side. By the way, primary means that that's going to be the winding that's going to have the incoming voltage, which we have here. Secondary is going to be where the output voltage is going to come out of. This is going to be the voltage to fire the plugs. Okay. Now, once that happens, then we have available out for us about up to 40 kV, probably a little bit even higher than that. That doesn't mean it's going to take 40,000 volts to fire the plugs. It just means we have that much of energy available to do the work if we need it. Now let's go back to this transistor. I'm going to show you an easier way how to understand this without worrying about base and emitter current and collector emitter current. Alright, we're going to draw this up another way. Now this is not how the transistor works, but um, you know I teach, uh, teach the guys out there, electrical guys, electrical techs, just an easier way how to understand how a transistor works. Okay, now let's say that I have a relay coil. Okay, now the relay coil is going to ground. Okay, all right, now this one out here, I need, I need a positive volts out here to turn this on. Remember, this is my DC negative. So I need a positive volts right here to turn on that relay coil. So that is my base. If you look right here, there's my base, there's my base. So what I need to turn it on, I'll use the same example. I need two volts on this relay coil. Now, this is gonna go up to a relay contact. Now, this relay contact is gonna go back up to, there's my coil, okay? Whoop, 12 volts. Okay, now, this point right here, that's gonna be my collector. And you look back over there, you can kind of see the similarity. This part down here, there's my emitter. So you see that when I put two volts on here, I'm going to close my relay contact, and then here comes my current right on down. Okay? When I take the zero volts and put over here on the base, now the relay coil is not energized, my contact opens up, and then I don't get any current flow. And that's exactly what's happening over here as far as uh, trying to understand it, okay? It's not got no relay contacts in there, but the principle is still the same if you want to think of it like this, okay? Now one last thing before we get away from this here transistor, and I'm talking about this here collector emitter junction will close and open based on the voltage on the base. Keep in mind that this here is not fully open and closes like a switch, okay? There is, even in the off condition, there is still a very, very small amount of current that flows, but it's so small that we can just forget about it. When uh, engineers and technicians talk about and analyzing, uh, you know, transistors and they're in a switch mode operation, for that small amount of current, we're talking, uh, we still consider it to be open and closed, okay? but. Keep in mind, there is a still a very small amount. Just want to make that, make that uh, clear there.